Build your better breakfast at Subway with the Tasty 250 Combo, a 16-ounce cup of freshly brewed Seattle's Best Coffee, and any delicious egg muffin melt. And don't hit the snooze on this deal. Right now, come in before 11 a.m. for a $5 foot-long breakfast sub. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. Now, now, now. Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. Gloomy day here in Southern California. Not as gloomy last night as the Baltimore Ravens with one of, with, finished a week of great covers with maybe one of the best in a while. The interception pick six taint touchdown, which hadn't happened in five years. Cousin Sal, I had the Ravens minus three in my Vegas contest. Yeah, very, tell. very exciting. Uh, how excited were you? I could tell by the number of exclamation points you left in the, in the follow-up text a minute after the uh, pick. But, Thank yeah, you. These night games, they have to stop fixing these night games. That's like three bizarre covers out of in the last, like, nine days, right? Or something. Are you counting the Eagles? I'll count the Eagles-Cowboys, yeah. I mean, I, that, that was the, the least uh, rattling of all of them, but... Obviously, uh, the Jeff Fisher debacle and uh, and last night. That was the Eagles one was just more of the traditional screw jab backdoor cover. Right. Thirty twenty, five minutes left or whatever, and you could just like, oh, here we go. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is going to happen. But um, yeah, but last night a lot had to happen for the Ravens to cover. I mean, after dominating the, most of the game, you know. Yeah, it was it, karmically it worked out, but still, once it gets into OT. I, I would love, I'd love to see somebody break this down. What the odds are once you get an OT of just a touchdown to end the game? And say, I bet. What do you think? Twenty percent of the time? Uh, that sounds right. Although I got to tell you, it seems like it's more than that in, in recent years. That's yeah, you might be right. So maybe one out of every five times, or two out of every nine. Yeah. And then I would say that that happening because of defense or special teams. Mm-hmm. So for, now, the Raven, for the Ravens to cover. Um, all right, so Schaub throws a touchdown pass to Johnson. They have to get the two-point conversion, which, I don't right. know, is that 50-50 right there? What are the odds for the two-point conversion even? Oh, it's like 45, 45%, but the Ravens' defense was so gassed, I felt like he was going to get it that time. Yeah, yeah, and he did. I mean, yeah, it was really did. like the announcers love to talk about how the defense is gassed, but this was a case where you could watch the game and go, wow, those guys are gassed. Like, those right. guys can't even freaking move. Yeah, it was a mess. And uh, the touchdown was on fourth down, right, I think? Well, there was a fourth down play in there. Yeah, there was a fourth down. They didn't score on fourth down, but th- yeah. it was funny. The two-point conversion play, which usually they have the quarterback roll out to one side or the other if he's going to throw. Mm-hmm. That one, he just they were like, just go back and look for somebody. It was almost like Thanksgiving yeah. like when you're playing with your family at Thanksgiving. I'm just going to go back. You guys get open. Because so he knew goes, he wasn't going to get rushed. Then it goes to overtime. The Ravens punt it, and uh, the Texans take over inside their 10, and there's a play – where uh, Schaub is rolling right, he's in the end zone, there's almost some holding going on, which would have meant the Ravens yeah. went by two and don't cover. Uh, it also would have been a, a joke, you know, you figure they at least went by three and push, but then, and then the, uh, the pick six. So we had that one, we had, I wrote about the Titans-Colts one on Friday a little bit, but the, the classic, and we bitch about this all the time, but w- once you get inside a minute and you need a touchdown and a field goal and these guys get stuck on the 25 and they're throwing short passes. And you're on the 25. Kitna did it correctly on Sunday yeah. night. Right. He was on, like, the 25 and took the shot downfield to the tight end and got to, like, I think the one-yard line. But that's what you have to do when you're on the 25. And I know you wrote about it, and it's been discussed. But that Jeff Fisher, he ought to be ashamed of himself. Uh, forget, I, I had the Colts last Thursday, and forget that he cost my kids, like, 12 Xboxes by not kicking a field goal. But yeah. I feel like he's, like, an unfit parent. Like, he doesn't know... As a coach, you have to have little confidence in a man who, like, all right, at some point if you need two scores, that's four plays, right? If you have the ball, you have to kick the field goal uh, or score a touchdown. You have to onside kick it. You have to then do another play and then maybe another play or set up for another field goal. So at most, like under 30 seconds, you have to try a field goal, right? Yeah, you have to because you need – 
the six seconds to get the onside kick. Yeah. And then you need to have enough time to, to throw at least a couple passes to get to around the 35, 40. Yeah. So you can get the realistic little bloop Hail Mary versus the one that the Jags converted, which never happens. Yeah, it's not college football. You don't get a little more credit for losing by three than you would seven, you know. My, uh, ECS rankings. I, I don't know. They didn't ask them about it, I don't think. And it's, it's troublesome. It really is. Well, my big issue with this is that there's a specific way to do it. Like, it's not something where you, you know, oh, depending on the moment, I'll play it this way. Like, you get to the 25, and you throw three passes into the end zone. If you don't get them, you kick a field goal. Yeah. You don't you don't then throw a little five-yard pass over the middle and a little checkout pass. And right. It, yeah, it's, those extra odds don't, uh, yards don't help you once you're in field goal. Right? It's really frustrating. So then we had another unbelievable cover, which, uh, where we had the Bucks winning by one because of a missed extra point, but that missed extra point meant that the Redskins covered, which mm-hmm. I think happens maybe, what, once every five years? Yeah, that's bad. And you, you brought something up with a fantasy league. What did you say? Did you... Oh, yeah. I was in a, So I did a book tour last week, and in one of the lines, I think it was Dallas, these guys said that, and I had told you guys this before we watched the Bucks Redskins game together. These guys have this rule in their fantasy league that any missed PAT is minus one hundred. <laughs> so if the guy misses, if the guy misses the extra point, it's just minus one hundred, and, and you, you you're lose probably going to lose for the week. So yeah. their point was that every extra point becomes a thousand times more exciting. Sure. And there's yeah. a lot of extra points, so when you have a kicker and it's just now you're on pins and needles with the extra point, I thought 100 was a little extreme. I would say minus 25 might be fun. Yeah. But I would just not have a kicker, or I would start a kicker that is Start not. a punter. I, I, would, I would have Chris Boniel kicking for me. Right. Well, what about minus 10 is fair? Minus 10 would be pretty good, but as soon as you said that, then Gano or with bad yeah. snap and, and they lose. So. We had a whole conversation about it, and an hour later, they missed the extra point. Yeah. And yeah. So that one was crazy, and the Eagles was a typical backdoor cover. The Jags cover was a little crazy because uh, the Raiders came and tied it with four minutes left, and you rarely see the team get the go-ahead spread cover and touchdown from that point, and they got it. And then uh, yeah, a lot of big play guys in that Jacksonville Oakland game. So that's why I knew we kind of weren't out of it. We had Jacksonville minus four, so we yeah. got lucky with that. So last week we had a whopping ten home underdogs. Wow! How many of them covered? Uh, I know the answer. Seven. Six. Was it six? Yep. Oh, well, that's not that too amazing. Well, I was just four. amazed that there was ten home underdogs. Oh right, yeah. It was a weird, weird, weird week. Yeah. And I guess the one thing you took away, you could take away from last week is that if you had just looked at it and said, all right, we have a lot of good teams playing bad teams. Mm-hmm. And the top six teams, which are the Giants, they were favored in the road. The uh, the Steelers were home but giving up a lot of points. Falcons were favored in the road. Saints were giving up a lot of points at home. Pats were giving three in the road, Eagles are giving three and a half on the road, Ravens are giving three. If you had just said, I'm just going to take all the good teams. Yeah. And I hope I go four and two. It's probably not a bad plan. You should have, especially at this point in the season. Yeah. Everything seems to even out. Te- bad teams probably checked out without saying it. It should work. Did it work? Is that what you're saying? In retrospect, yeah. I wish I had thought of it. You know, uh, I talked myself into the Panthers against the Falcons and it, and uh, that my Bengals logic against the Steelers was really sound. I forgot that Carson Palmer just could single-handedly kill me. But there's something really wrong with that Steelers team, and we're going to get into that. But I, Roethlisberger's just getting pounded. Yeah, he and is. It's going to surface one of these games because he takes a lot of hits. They don't really move the ball anymore. And uh, and he's almost at that Favre level where he physically it mm-hmm. looks like he's – borderline can't go anywhere. He's getting so. beat up. Well, if you do the math on it, if you lose an offensive lineman a week, which it seems is what's <laughs> going on with the Steelers, that's 16 offensive linemen. You're right. Playing. And 18 once they change the schedule to 18. Games. And you also, when you're throwing a broken foot, and uh, they, and they play the Jets this week, which we're going to do. Let's do the Lions. But I think that Jets, when you look at how desperate that Jets team is, all right. And you uh, look at all the blitzes they're going to throw at him from every possible angle. I think that's a trouble matchup for them. That's an Steelers. interesting game. All right, but Thursday night, San Fran at San Diego. Not not such an interesting game. Not, and yet, crazily, there's two division 
two divisions uh, at stake here. I know. The, the West team should not be allowed to play each other and from different conferences because it's, it's too unpredictable. Get on that, Goodell. We have that Cardinals bet, the Cardinals to win the division, which somehow isn't dead yet, even though they're 4-9. and <laughs> Were they 4-9? 4-9. Uh, someone wrote to you about the, uh, that uh, all four teams could be 6-10 and 10 entering. 6-9. Uh, six 6-9 and six and nine week, yeah. entering week 17, yeah. yeah. And I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that's foolish. And then I looked at it, I'm like, wow, that's not only possible, but that's probably going to happen. Yeah, if you look at the next two games for each NFC West team, yeah. A, a quartet of six and nine is really, really possible. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I said uh, I said Chargers by eight and a half. Wow! All right, you hit it exactly. I said six and a half. I don't know. You know, Sam Vegas has had a love affair with San Fran, and I just thought they'd stick with that. But eight and a half seems fair. My here is my rationale. It's the Chargers now in playoff mode. If they lose one more time, they're out basically. Mm-hmm. So I think that has to be a playoff line, and I think if, if this was the playoffs, that would have been the line. You know, but every every team you look at, you could point to one or two games like, oh, that was that's an exception. They're just not like that. You look at all eight West teams. There are five games. Whether you think they're great or you want to make the point that they're terrible, there are five games that screw you up each, yeah. any way you go. So the True. Raiders got killed by the the uh, Chargers got killed by the Raiders. The Niners certainly <laughs> look awful, but and then great. And it's, it's just uh, it, it, it gets me dizzy, these divisions. What do we Washington, got? Uh, let's do it. Sunday, Washington at Dallas. Oh. By the way, great time. You didn't even mention we went to Dallas. This well, I, was, I was saving it for the end. All right. All right. Okay. Re- Redskins at Dallas. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say the Cowboys are now getting the benefit of the – they're out of the playoffs, but they're still playing hard and they can put up points. Benefit of the doubt. And it's Cowboys by seven and a half. Okay, I said six, and it is in fact six. So, but I do think uh, the Cowboys smoke them. I like the Cowboys. I think them, and don't don't expect uh, to show a choice to be asking Donovan McNabb for his autograph anytime soon. The one thing about, and I don't know whether the, I don't know whether it was because the Eagles were there, but it would, the same thing's going to happen this week because it's the Redskins. They hate the Redskins, but the crowd's really good. Yeah, it's been good for. When you throw in like that team season ended four weeks ago, basically the the level of uh, intensity in the building, I was very surprised by. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they were excited to see us, and uh, you know that could have been it, division rival. But I'm also thinking this this is uh, you know some of the guys we were hanging with that. And one thing I asked them was like, out of the NFC East teams, we hate them all. Cowboys do. Which, which who does Jerry like beating the most? And he said, without a doubt, the Redskins. Mm. And, uh, so this becomes their Super Bowl. I think so. And and from what we've seen to the Redskins, they're really ready for, you know, they've done it before, but they have another El Foldo in them. Mm-hmm. This could be like a 47 to 10 type game. Yeah, this is Jerry's last uh, to prove that, uh, all right, I got one thing right. I didn't hire Mike Shanahan. Let, let's, let's, uh, let's demonstrate that on the field. All right, so we're teasing the Cowboys with, let's well, let's, let's. Well, San Diego's not bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, we might have it right there. All right, so I don't know what you want to do with this line. There's most most casinos or whatever didn't have a line on this. Kansas City at St. Louis. I did find one, but I, I think we should throw. I think we should throw this game out. Let's throw it out because I saw one and a half. St. Louis one and a half, but um, it's uh, that, I assume that's with Croyle playing. Uh, they, they don't know who's the quarterback of this team yet. Well, I I mean, if Castle was playing, I think that line should be like Chiefs by two. That's what I was thinking. Two, two and a half. Yeah, but if the if if it's Brody Croyle, it's got to be Rams by three. Mm-hmm. I think. I, mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's zero for ten now as a starter. It's and the Rams West are a pretty games. good home team. Just sickening these West games. And also, we watched that Rams Saints game. We you know it was twenty one six, but they were uh, they were driving. They were inside, I think, the twenty, and Bradford just made the the classic. It was mis- fourteen six. It was 14, 14, sorry, fourteen yeah. six. Their Rams are driving near the end of the half. Mm-hmm. Bradford makes the classic rookie QB, tries to force it. Guy picks it off, takes the distance, game over basically. But that's a throw that he's not going to make in three years. Yeah. But I thought the Rams are right there in that first half. And at the worst case scenario, it's fourteen to nine. Um, I still don't think the Rams are bad. Ugh, I don't think they are either. I mean, look, we could say this for the next few weeks. I don't think they're bad. I don't think they're bad. No, I'm just salivating at the chance to bet against them that first Saturday when they're home against <laughs> All right. the, the Giants or, you know, 
good. Yeah. Well, good they were right there in that game. Whoever. Uh, all right, Houston and Tennessee. Yeah. Texans by one. Texans by one? Yeah. All right, who gets this here? I said uh, I said Tennessee by three. It's Tennessee by one and a half. I think I get it, right? You get that, yeah. Yeah, I get it. Nice. I don't see how that Titans team is favored over anybody at this point, unless it's like the Cardinals yeah. or the you Panthers. You can say that about six games <laughs> this week. You really can. Do you think Fisher, you know, I mean, it's easy to just say he bet on the game. Obviously, he didn't. That would be the Let's just leave it at that because there's no other explanation. (laughs) It would be the biggest sports scandal, I think, in 50 years. Yeah. So do you think there's something to just like, you know, your job's in jeopardy and you lose, but you lose 30 to 28. So maybe you're hoping the owner just maybe didn't go to the game and he just looked at the, oh, we came close. Manning, not bad. That's funny. The owner, he's in uh, he's in South France um, living it up, and he maybe just checks the box score. The owner's away. He doesn't check the box score and see that the last touchdown was scored with 0-0-0 yeah. zero, zero, on the clock. Yeah, right. I was like, oh, we, we almost had that one, huh, Jeff? Yeah, you missed it. Manning just killed us. Two-minute drive. We were supposed to lose by four and a half, weren't we? Oh, we <laughs> lost by three. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Jeff is really keeping things in order. Yeah, well, you covered. <laughs> Uh, disgraceful. I know you've used the Madden analogy many times, but he, he should be sentenced to 100 hours of, of Manning until he gets that right. Of Madden? Madden. What did I say, Manning? Yeah. Well, maybe they should have some sort of a, uh, you know, one of those seminars. Like all the coaches go for two days and they just mm-hmm. hang out with 14 year old nerds. Yeah. Who explain it's like to the them. guy, like uh, when, you're, when you're playing Madden and the guy is fourth and 15 from his own 25, and you know he's got a good offense, so there's a chance he could make it, but he, and he goes for it, and it's early yeah. in the game. It's like, I don't want to play with you anymore. That's how yeah. I feel with Jeff Fisher. I don't want to play with you. I don't want you as a Cowboys coach. I don't want to bet for you or against you anymore. Let me ask you this. Yeah. If, let's say the, the Texans were down seven, and they scored to cut it to one yesterday with like 20 seconds left. Would you have gone for two with how gassed the Ravens were? Just to end it, you just yeah, kind of maybe. get rid of them. I mean, right that's there. the kind of thing that maybe keeps your uh, your your job as a coach, something like that. Other than uh, because it relying on the coin toss, right? If you get that, that changes your whole season. And everybody talks about your balls, yeah, and that you you sense the moment. And this is a breakout for Gary Kubiak. It would have been interesting. Anyway, yeah. let's keep going. All right, Arizona, Carolina. <laughs> oh, the crap ball. <laughs> What a terrible game. Arizona ended up putting a lot of points up last week. Uh, you know, every 40? time I curse a team and declare them the worst in the league, they come out like uh, the the following week, like the 85, 86 Bears. And uh, I think I'm going to try something different here. Hold, bear with me for one second. <laughs> okay. You have to be impressed, Bill, with the way Carolina is moving the ball. That's, uh, Mark Goodson's a force to be reckoned with on the ground. John Casey's as solid as they come. Yeah. I really feel this Panthers team can make some noise the uh, rest of December. Nice. Let's look for them to run the table. They were right there in that Falcons game. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, you know, what's interesting is that Skelton came in for Derek Anderson, and he didn't even have a good game, but just the fact that he wasn't Derek Anderson ignited the team. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes it's the coach that takes over. Yeah, yeah it was the uh, it was the, the getting rid of the quarterback that no one liked versus getting rid of the coach that no one liked for Denver and who was going to win. And Arizona came up. I am incredibly going to say that the Cardinals are favored by three and a half. The Cardinals are favored by three and a half. Yeah. All right. Throw that should, one out. I said Carolina by one and a half. And incredibly, it's Carolina by three. Oh, six and a <laughs> half points off. Wow. Yeah, what, what, are you kidding me? You don't think the Panthers should be favored by three points? <laughs> oh, I thought I thought coming off last week, wow, I don't think I've been six and a half points off a game all year. Well, it's an awful game. Vegas doesn't know what they're doing with this. It, just see, it seems pretty clear now that Carolina is gunning for that number one pick, I think. Because yeah. they, they've had a couple of games here where they've been in it, and then all of a sudden they – Coincidentally, self-combust. I mean, they have like seven thousand fans at these games. What, are, what? What's even going on anymore? I'll, I'll I'll rephrase another way. They're idiots if they win this game. Yeah, <laughs> I think both teams shouldn't even try. This is well. The cards are. They already have enough wins. Now. Oh, they have I mean, four wins already. Yeah, they're not. I mean, they. Oh God. That, see, I was factoring, when I did the three and a half, I was factoring the cards aren't mathematically eliminated yet. And then you have the Panthers that, unless they're complete morons, should do everything they can not to win this game. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I would definitely tell Jonathan Stewart maybe to sit out to rest the phantom ankle injury that he doesn't have. And well, the problem is with this one, you could very well do everything you can to not win the game and still uh, still prevail by 17 points. True. The only thing is, it seems like the Cardinals can run the ball a little bit mm. now. Yeah, I don't know what happened a week ago, but Hightower showed up last yeah. week. So is there who are, who are the two win teams? The Bengals have two wins. I'm looking this up as we talk. Bengals have two wins, and I think uh, uh, the Lions that, have three. Oh wait, wait, no, that's it. Bengals. Yeah, Cincinnati is two. So, you know, I, I just <laughs> why would Carolina want to win this? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know excited. that anyone is the, the number one pick is like, you know that. They definitely know who's going to be, and you know, number one and number two might not be a difference. I thought it was a mortal lock that Andrew Luck was the number one pick. Yeah? Yeah, if he came out. I guess. And I guess. that, you know, when you see what Bradford did for the Rams. He... Mm, just and also that. So many so many uh, issues to address. To, to just throw the quarterback in doesn't always make, make it work. And also with the salary scale and the way that shifted, or that's going to shift with the lockout, you're not. It's not as big of a gamble to take a quarterback first as it was. Yeah. Anyway. Jacksonville at Indy. Big, big game. Whoever wins in the driver's seat for the NFC South crown. I love the Jags. They've taken care of me the last couple oh, of weeks. please. Ah, they have. I, I like people who take care of me. Yeah. Uh, I have the Colts by four. Uh, you got it. I said three and a half, and it's four and a half. Fair. I think that settles at four, though. It's a little high. Yeah, it's a little high. Like the they, Jags. Uh, they could have gone away last week. They could have gone away against the Raiders. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I have to examine that one more. That's a nice game, though. That's good. I mean, there's yeah. about four good games coming up. Uh, New one. Orleans at Baltimore. Another good one. I'll be impressed with New Orleans if they win this game. I know they've been scoring in the mid-30s the last five weeks, but... I think the Ravens ruined all rights to be favored by three in this game based off last night's performance and how easy it is to throw on them, which means the line is either two or two and a half, and I'm going to say two. I'm glad you said two, because it's two and a half. And I said three, so we both get it. And and uh, and I was going to say two and a half for the last 24 hours, and somehow at the last <laughs> second they switched to two. Good, good. The change yeah. finally worked in my favor. Yeah, uh, these are two five seeds, it looks like, going at it, right? Yeah, but the Saints are playing a lot better than the Ravens are playing. Mm. And I, I think they're just better. This is it. The Saints, um, boy, the Saints. So we're figuring that Saturday game is Saints at Seattle or Saints at St. Louis, right? Which would, which is what happened last week. Hey, the there's no Saturday games this week, right? There are no Saturday games. I think they start up next week. Oh, good. Right in time for the holidays. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Cleveland at Cincinnati. Uh. I had Bengals by one and a half. Well, you should stick with that because that's exactly what it is. And I'm an idiot. I said Cincy by three and a half. I just, I don't know why I still don't count Cleveland as a decent road team. They were terrible in Buffalo. If you're going to have Carolina giving three at home, you kind of have to give Cincinnati three at home, don't you? You know, they're in that, I don't know, they Carson Palmer. It's not even fun to joke about anymore. He should throw, you know how they all have the throwback uniforms? He should throw, uh, wear a throw-forward uniform. He should really wear a 49ers jersey <laughs> to the game this Sunday. I thought you were going to say he should throw back to his 2006 jersey. Yeah, that, that would be maybe nice The one that he wore in 2006. Well, yeah. USC fun- or maybe his high school jersey. It's funny, though, that they're having these articles about, you know, because if you cut a guy now before the new cap comes in, you, you're not going to get killed. Mm-hmm. And uh, people are like, what should they do with Carson Palmer? Like, well, here's what you should do. You should cut him because he's terrible. So bad. So hey. and you, that pick six, really, it's just a matter of if, if his interception is going to be run back for touchdowns. Like, how Two, bad are his interceptions? He couldn't even deliver the uh, backdoor cover for me. No. Which really, the Steelers were in a prevent, and uh, and somehow he still threw a pick into three people. Mm-hmm. Terrible. All right, really, Detroit at Tampa Bay. Now, was that were you impressed by? Well, I'll pick the game first. I, I said Bucks by six. Ah, uh, it is six. I said five and a half. 
Hold on, let me just add this up. Now you're up five to four, including our tie. Were you impressed by Detroit, or was that just 100% Aaron Rodgers guy? I don't know. I kept looking at that game. No, it wasn't. That, they were doing a good job on him uh, before he went out. I agree. I thought they, the whole game, they were in his face. That defense is so solid, too. Yeah. It, it really, uh, but we, we, uh, but then you look at Stanton's numbers, and they, they didn't do it on the ground exactly. You know, like, wow, how did they win that game? So. They they uh, got worked by the Pats, obviously, on Thanksgiving, and that was fresh in my mind, and that was the reason I took Green Bay. Yeah, well, they're still three and ten in lousy, and now they go on the road. No, I know, but I'm saying like, I think now we have to look at these teams that the Patriots have played the last couple weeks mm-hmm. when they've killed them. Mm-hmm. Maybe the Patriots are just really good, and you can't take away Maybe anything. Maybe the Patriots are really good. Of course, oh. they're really good. Well, you know, I have to. No, I mean, really, really, really good. Is yeah, my point. yes, yes, they are. They don't turn the ball over in five straight games. That's unheard of. Like the Pat, so the Pats beat them on Thanksgiving, forty-five twenty-four. The next yeah. week, the Lions played Chicago, and they played them close. And that game was twenty-four twenty. And you looked at it and you said, "Ah, the trap game for the Bears." Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Then they beat the Packers seven three. I think you just throw the New England game out and just look at those last two, and you know they could they could hang with Tampa. Tampa barely barely got by that Washington team. I guess so. And Tampa's not the kind of team that jumps up on your fourteen nothing, which I think that's that's where Detroit would have trouble, like uh, mounting an offensive comeback. But we're gonna do a thirty for thirty, trying to figure out how Washington didn't win that game. <laughs> the, the running back rushed for one hundred and fifty yards in, the, in like the first ten minutes. I know before we sat down at our table. They well, missed two you know, field goals you, under 30. They were up, what were they, up six? In the mm-hmm. Four minutes left, Tampa did nothing? Was, that was incredible. Yeah, and we were watching the game together. And uh, I don't know if I could say, it was in a Buffalo Wild Wings. Which, by the way, I, as soon as I knew we were in there, I, I immediately called and, and bet all the underdogs because in the commercial, every game goes to overtime. So <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I got it. But, uh, but um <laughs> And then and then they win the Bucks win in stunning fashion and even though we're watching the game together you you excuse yourself and then go make a call to leave on my message voicemail oh I did yeah I mean I, mean, I must have been drunk cousin Sal did you see what I just saw Bucks seventeen skin sixteen Josh Freeman he doesn't even have to be on the field to block that extra point he used Jedi mind tricks. And speaking of Jedi mind tricks and unintentional comedy and Pearl Jam, buy my paperback, Bill Simmons' Big Book of Basketball, just like the hardcover. Only difference is I switched Arvita Sabonis from number 196 to number 187. Now give me a paycheck. <laughs> I was hammered when I left that. Really weird that we're watching yeah. the game and you still have to go and make that call. It's, it's a habit now. Unbelievable. You know what else was weird is that we were we were sitting at a table at Buffalo Wild Wings, <laughs> and our friend Brad and I decided to walk across the street <laughs> and get barbecue. <laughs> and we had a whole other lunch and came back and just sat down at the table again. I've never left a restaurant to eat another restaurant before. During the games, you went to you went from ten screens to two screens. Huh? And we had to. It was we were in Texas. Yeah. So we went to this place called Coulter's and had really nice ribs. No, and uh, and it was great, and we got to see Aaron Rodgers get concussed and yeah. eat some ribs, and then came back. And but I, I, I seriously, I was, I've never done that before in my life. I was really torn as, as a big football fan who has to watch all the games, and, and a fat pig who appreciates um, good ribs. <laughs> I really didn't know what to do, and I stayed, and you guys went. All right, so that was that. All right, next game: Buffalo at Miami. My, I wish Miami was on the road here because I'd like them more. Uh, uh, I'm gonna. It, it's just they're going to win. They're going to lose the whole rest of the season. Can't say goodbye to that team. Well, I think the one thing they've taught us is that all of their home games have to be in the Vegas zone. And mm. I'm going to say Dolphins by five and a half. Oh, man. You're hitting some of these exactly. Thank you. I said Vegas zone, too, but I thought it was four and a half, and it, it is five and a half. Wait a minute. How many exact do you have here? I like the slate this week. Too much cheating going on. I, I, was, I was on an airplane yesterday just staring at the, at right. the games. With the, right, with you the three in a row exactly. I don't think we've ever done four in a row exactly. Oh stop! I had, last year there was one where I had like five in a row. Five games in a row exactly. Yeah, you went crazy. You were accusing me of cheating. That doesn't sound right at all. Yeah. All right, Philly at the Giants. Uh, I think I just said minus three for this. Has to be. You said three. 
Giants by three. I said two and a half, and I got it exactly. So I'm back on board here. It's wow. Five to it's six to five. You. So that that's Vegas announcing the Eagles are better than the Giants. And I think they are. I think I think they're slightly better. I mean, who who do you on a neutral field? You take you take Philly, don't you? They lost some guys last week, though. Yeah. They lost the the linebacker. They lost somebody else. I don't know. I just I watch Michael Vick. I know I joked about this. I said no matter what, we should come back from Dallas and tell everyone Michael Vick is the fastest guy. You have to if you don't see it in person. Right. Oh boy, you you don't know football. But uh, I think Deshaun Jackson is the fastest human I've ever seen. Right. He's that was incredible to watch those two plays in person. Yeah. I think watching a bomb in person is the coolest thing you can see at a sporting event. Yeah. It's really exciting. It's seven great seconds. I know. And what we said, like, he went down the field, Vic. He scored 10 points, uh, fantasy points in his opening drive, which is almost impossible for a quarterback. (laughs) He is, in person, the best quarterback to go see. He's really incredible. Even watching him warm up, we were kind of, or at least I was, I was just like in awe of the way he threw the ball. Yeah. And now to the Giants for a second. Don't you feel like they should have to forfeit a, a home game at some point? I, that was a farce. Well, that and now, I mean, make a huge donation to Katrina or pay for the uh, reparations of the rooftop. Or they're getting too much bang for their buck here. That was outrageous. I, I mean, that was the single biggest advantage for any team this year of, of a fluke circumstance. Well, I, I feel like that was the dumbest move we made. We should have we should have pounded them last night. Well, especially once Favre went out, you know, it's yeah. like, man, that just sunk the air out of them. The Vikings do you, do you, can't, yeah, they can't be up for that game. Yeah. Hey, Sal, did hmm. you, uh, do you know Favre's streak ended last night? What? Yeah, 297. <laughs> He's done. That is amazing. I mean, why are we, the guys retiring in four days? Who cares? The streak was going to end four weeks from now. They People acted like this was Lou Gehrig. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 297. Great. Enough. So we need to put that into perspective. Um, <laughs> before yesterday, Favre had been threatening to not play and then miraculously figured a way to take the field every game since 1992. Yeah. Favre had been killing his team by playing when he shouldn't have for seven straight weeks in a row. Right. <laughs> 297 consecutive Thursday press conferences where he declared himself ineligible before springing back to life. Miraculous. Uh, My hat goes off to him. Enough with this guy. Uh, God. I, I just, I couldn't believe that was like, you know, the, the Cliff Lee signing happens and ESPN can't even cut over because they're not done with the 20-minute homage to Favre yet. Right. It's like Cliff Lee just signed with the Phillies. This Trump's the Favre thing. Nobody cares about Favre. Nobody. That, that, that Texans game was great, and I, yeah. I tune in for the after thing, and it's just, yeah, he's just he's like crying at the, the podium again. Which we've What's seen wrong with us? Uh, Atlanta, at Saint, uh, Atlanta at Seattle. These are the late afternoon games. Oof. You know, normally I would have given this a seven and a half, but I think Quest is worth a point and a half. I'm going to say Falcons by six. All right, I said six also. It's six and a half. Ugh. And this is my upset special. I like are, Seattle. What am I even doing taking a West team? But this is this is it. They're due for a stink bomb. Yeah. And it's not even like they've been playing Porto. They take care of everyone in line on the road and on home. But I like Seattle here. Sorry. All right. Sorry, everyone. Jets at Pittsburgh. Why are you apologizing? Well, because it's going to lose. So don't, don't warn you in advance. Jets at Pittsburgh. This is my upset special, and I'm going to say Steelers by four. Uh, you get it. I said three and a half, and it's six. <laughs> wow! Really? I, I thought about it. I said I had the same reaction, and I'm like, "Well, the Jets don't—they just don't score points." And at the end of the game, that—that that, uh, seems to be a factor. So and that's Vegas out. saying, "Vegas is saying to us, go ahead, take Mark Sanchez on the road. Go ahead, do it. Yeah, do it. Take him on the road against one of the best five defenses." Right. I don't agree with that. Maybe line. they give him a. Maybe they give him a, a, a game. Can I defend the uh, Sal's of the world, uh, specifically Sal Alosi, the um, strength and conditioning coach? Who, Please do. Who, uh, uh, you know, Nolan Carroll, the, the, the Dolphins special teams guy running down the sidelines, he sticks out his foot or does not whatever, and he trips him up. And uh, let me just say, you're a world-class athlete in this league. You've got to be ready for everything. 
All right. You, uh, you know, you, you come down the sidelines, coaches, players, everybody's trying to make their team better. And uh, stop crying, Nolan Carroll. That's it. Great points. Great points. There you go. I uh, I actually thought he should have been fired. Of course he should have been fired. I, I just, just suspended him for the year, and then that's it. I mean, what? <laughs> what is he going to do next year? I think these strength and conditioning coaches are nuts. The more I hear about them, they're just, they're just all crazy. I think um, Rex Ryan just might be fearing for his life. If you had, like, if there was some sort of equivalent late-night talk show situation <laughs> where Jay Leno came on and you had some security guard just stick his knee out and trip him <laughs> so he was coming out, I think the guy gets fired. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, well, no, on our show, he'd probably get promoted. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he'd probably be good director credit. Uh, uh, this is a good game. I, I, I want to write the Jets off at this point, but um, watch them come back here. I... Put it this way, if this team has any heart at all, they, they win this game or come close. Yeah. And I don't necessarily – I mean, yeah, it's a big game for the Steelers, but I don't think it's uh, – Well, it's especially, a, I guess they'll know if Baltimore loses to New Orleans, then it'll become less of a game for Is them. this a Sunday night game? No, it's Sunday late afternoon. Yeah, because um, uh, – oh, because we should mention the Steelers, their last two are Carolina and then at Cleveland. Mm-hmm. So they're in the playoffs, put it that way. Yep. Denver at Oakland. So I have to win these next two to tie you. Otherwise, it's another win for sports for guy. I'm now, I'm going to hit this exact. Raiders by seven. Uh, it's six and a half. I said four and a half. You got it anyway. Thank you. So congratulations on week 15. Thank you. Who is, uh, is anyone taking Denver here? I'm done with them. They killed me this year. Killed me. Uh, yeah, I, I still don't understand the McDaniels firing. What, just do it after the year, because they well, were playing hard for him already. It's you fire a coach when your teams quit and they hadn't quit. So I don't know what that accomplished. Yeah, I think you think it's just because of uh, like the Leslie Frazier and Jason Garrett. Like this is maybe maybe he got like trigger happy because he saw that uh, teams do respond to firings. Yeah, I thought it was dumb. John All right, last Skelton. one. John, you can't beat John Skelton. You're uh, you're an interim coach at best. That's it. Yep. Uh, um, all right, your your game, Green Bay at New England, Sunday night. We have two left. Well, yeah, but there's no line on the Monday night game. I don't know why they wouldn't put a line on. It. Are they not uh, assuming uh, that Favre's playing? Yeah. Uh, Who cares? Sunday night was a tough one. I said Pats by seven and a half. Right, I said ten, and it's ten and a half. What? Is Rodgers playing? I suppose. I mean, I mean, they're killing everybody. What does ten, it matter? I mean, I know ten and a half. With, it'll be worse with Flynn, but ten just and a half. Everyone. Yeah, but uh, well, they don't a, turn the ball over. How, how are you going to lose? That seems high. I, uh, maybe, maybe I'm underrating the Pats. Uh, of course you are, and, and they're winning. The, uh, they're going to win. Honestly, everybody listening out there hates the Patriots. Now's the time to just bring up their cheating. And anything you can, just hold on to anything, <laughs> any morsel of uh, why they might well, be bad or not be doing this right. F- they're winning the Super Bowl. As my friend Peter King pointed out, they have a higher winning percentage since game one that led to Spygate in 2007 oh. versus oh. Uh, before it. That's if you assume that they're done cheating. And I don't. L- last game is Bears at Vikings, and I said Bears by two and a half. Well, yeah, I said three, and there's no line. I can't find a line anywhere. That line, that line should be probably two and a half or three. I'm guessing. Yeah. All right. Last thing, we went to uh, went to Dallas this week. We went to the stadium, and after the game, you you lay down on the star. Oh. It it t- so we took a picture. Talk, like these girls talk about like mud baths and everything and scrubs, but nothing's as cleansing to the the body and soul of a Cowboys fan as laying on that star and doing uh, the equivalent of snow angels. What what a beautiful thing. I've never seen you so happy, and I can honestly say that. <laughs> this is after we lost, too. Yeah. And, and you, you know, for you, that was a great game because it was close and they played hard, but you lost and it was better for your draft pick. And I always say that. I'm like, oh, I just want us to be competitive and lose. And then they lose, and, like, for 45 minutes, I'm depressed. But um... Well, it's, it's hard to root against teams that you – it's hard to root against your team when they're playing a team that you hate. Yeah, right, exactly. So Eagles, Redskins, Giants, it's just you're not going to be able to turn that switch off. But we were, we were treated like kings all weekend, and Alec and Chad showed us a great time, and we uh, 
we ate, they brought us to a Mexican restaurant, which co- coming from L.A. is a real treat. I mean, you don't get that. <laughs> you don't get that a lot. But uh, but no, we did. Uh, they, they, I mean, that place is phenomenal, right? Are you writing on it or something? Are you going to? I'll probably write something. I mean, I the thing for me with that stadium is the TV just pushes it so far over the top in a good way. You know, and it, mm-hmm. you just you go there and you think like, well, every boxing event should definitely be here. Mm-hmm. Arguably, every WrestleMania should be there. Right. Um, you know, they were explaining to us that concerts actually don't work as well as you'd think because every band has their own stage. Oh, right, yeah. And they uh, and they don't just want to go with the flow at the stadium because they have their yeah. own setup. But, uh, you know, Dallas could really make a run at Vegas, I think, for big fights. Yeah, yeah. I think they should have a fight a month because the TV is so big that I, I can honestly say I felt like it was a little too big. Yeah, well, you have to like, and I went last year, and uh, if you're wearing a cap, you kind of have to put the the lid down a little bit, otherwise you're going to watch the screen the whole time. And um, it's yeah. it's really tough not to just. I, I started getting sleepy because we just eaten, and I was in a comfortable chair, and I was, and the TV's right there, and it was like I was ready to to put a pillow on my lap and, yeah. and take a nap. They should have great. I mean, the Pacquiao, whatever, but I said this to you the other day, like, don't even put a ring in there. Just have these guys run around on the field, and, they, you know, they still have to stay in bounds. But who? I'd love to see you guys fight on a 100-yard field. It's just for – and the way they did it was so logical with, with uh, the suites, and and they didn't waste a lot of those high, high, high seats where it's really hard for the people to get up there. And, and also, uh, I would love to – I'm really mad I didn't go to that boxing match now after seeing how cool that stadium was. Yeah. Well, there'll be more. And the other thing is, like, the indoors, like, they have some great things set up. Like, you got, there's a bar area where the players run out. Right. That, that's a great idea. That's they have those, yeah, they have bunker bunker suites. Yeah. And you can't even really see the field, but they said that uh, everybody loves being down there. The uh, the other thing, the, the, I thought those end zone suites were spectacular. Yeah. They're right, like, basically where the Lambeau Wall would be for um, – for I mean I guess the one thing you lose is you don't have the fans in the end zone but th- mm. those seem like two of the coolest seats you could have at a sporting event. Oh, it was great. When I and, went last year, I just basically went to my seat and just watched the game and I was nervous. But we had the tour and doesn't it seem like it's they're like the seven swankiest new bars in L.A. Or right. set up in the stadium, but like without the a hole L.A. clientele, like the girls. The girls will actually look at you when you walk in. Right. Mostly because uh, your friend Brad has three ounces of uh, Jack cheese hanging from his lips. <laughs> but, but no, it's it's really a, it's nice. It was super super clean too. Yeah. And I just think like the Pats built the state of the art stadium eight years ago, and it's not state of the art anymore because that Texas stadium just blew it away. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Gillette has some nice things about it, but. Um, I'll be interested to see the next, the, this decade of stadiums, whether they emulate that TV. The other thing, I, I'd, I'd never read about the TV, so I didn't know. I assumed it was like, I didn't know how they did it, but it's like, I don't know, thousands of individual little TVs, mm-hmm. and they raised it up with sandbags and then replaced the sandbags one at a time with the actual TVs. Right. So anytime a TV goes out, they could just go up there and replace it. it seemed pretty logical. Yeah, and the rabbit ears don't really get in the way. You would think <laughs> no. it would be giant. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It was yeah. pretty neat. It got me excited for this L.A. stadium and if, if it ever happens because um, now that I think all the people that are building stadiums are now stealing the best things from the other new stadiums that mm-hmm. have been built. And if you have the right people in place to build the L.A. football stadium, that thing could just be uh-huh. spectacular. It would be great. So, Cousin Sal, we are going to go with – do we like the Jets, or you you were fired up about the Lions? Well, the Cowboys Chargers would be a oh, is it, uh, is it an upset? You're saying? Yeah, I'm sticking with Seattle. I know it makes no sense, and I hate these West teams. And I'll I'll bitch about it next week, but Seattle's my upset. I'm Over intrigued time. by that Chargers Cowboys tease. Yeah. All right, we'll we'll discuss later. Let me uh, promote Jimmy Kimmel Live tonight. Kevin Spacey and uh, the Goo Goo Dolls. The rest of the week, Jeff Bridges, Mark Wahlberg, Diddy's on the show. Good week for us. And I think you and I are shooting a fantasy football ad. Oh, cool. Yeah, look for that. All right. All right. Talk to you soon. Good job, Billy. Good job. Before we go, we'd be remiss if we didn't call America's favorite Yankee fan. He's sitting at work right now. I know he's stewing, and he's reading Red Sox websites and just getting mad about everything that's happened, losing Cliff Lee. 
Crawford, Gonzalez. He's in a funk right now. So naturally, that's the best time to have him in the podcast. He's going to be in the Subway Fresh Take Hotline right now, calling him at work. Jacko. Conflicts litigation, this is John. Ah! Johnny! <laughs> Are you calling to gauge my excitement about the Russell Martin era? Well, I'm all fired up. I'm just trying to find what jersey number he's going to wear so I can buy that. Anytime you can add a washed-up catcher and a washed-up shortstop, and that's your winter arsenal, you got to do it. <laughs> Congratulations. I take umbrage at the washed-up shortstop, but, yeah, washed-up catcher, I'll, I'll, I'll second that emotion, yes. <laughs> I live in L.A. The Dodger fans are very excited to get rid of Russell Martin. Well, he was already gone from them because they non-tendered him, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's probably, I don't know, I was going to say he's probably an upgrade over Jesus Montero and Francisco Cervelli, but I'm not sure that that's the case. So, Johnny, where do you want to begin? Should we talk about the rejuvenated Red Sox, or we should talk about the Brian Cashman not closing the deal and not being able to get Cliff Lee? <laughs> it's, it's your podcast, Willie, whatever you decide. Let's talk about Cliff Lee first. All right. So uh, last night, you, you know, you can kind of see this coming. because Yeah, you can see it coming for days, really. Because they gave him the offer, and Cliff yeah. Lee's like, hey, thanks for the offer. Uh, I'll get back to you. Yeah. And then a couple days passed, and a couple more days passed, and it became increasingly clear that Cliff Lee wanted no part of the vaunted New York Yankees and their 27 titles. Exactly. That's exactly true. If you, if this had happened last week, I would have been like throwing things against the wall and screaming and ranting and pulling my hair out. But with the way that it's dragged on like it has for, for almost a week now, or at least since last week, um, I've kind of fallen out of love with Cliff Lee. Oh. So I'm I'm really – and part of me was really nervous about that, the seventh year of that contract, and I realized it's only money. But, you know, with with Hal Steinbrenner in charge now as a bean counter, you have to start worried about all this dead weight in contracts. And a 39-year-old Cliff Lee, I, I think, would have been throwing good money after bad. So, yes, I was excited about the prospect of if Pettit came back and you could run three lefties out against the – Wanted Red Sox new lineup that all star at every position, but um, well, that's not true, and you know it. I know that's a little. You, a little you're already here's what bugs me is you're already in reverse jinx mode with the Red Sox. <laughs> Don't think I haven't I noticed. December fourteenth, of course I am. Um, but you know, Cliff Lee was twelve and nine last year. I realized he was lights out in the in the in the postseason. He was great. He owned the Yankees. He owned the Rays in the first round. He did lose two games in the World Series. So, yes, he's a very good pitcher. Um, I think the Yankees desperately needed him, as evidenced by their contract offer, clearly. But I don't know. I'm I'm not as bummed out as I thought I would be today, quite frankly. I mean, you look at his stats. Yeah. In 06, had a pretty mediocre year, Mm. 14-11, 440-ARA, 224 hits in 200 innings, 1.4 whip. Mm Mm-hmm. Walks not bad. 2007 just gets shellacked. Like he's almost out of the league. Five and eight, six twenty nine ERA. This one he got sent back down to the minors, I believe. Sent back down to the minors. Things turn around in 08 mm-hmm. and 09. Last year, obviously, very good. But it's basically a three year window of him pitching very well. And right now, now he's and phenomenal hitting his mid thirties. Phenomenal in the postseason, right. though, as you pointed out. Maybe not in the World Series. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, he's a lefty. He's, you know, he's he's tested in the American League. Obviously, a very good pitcher. Obviously, an upgrade over Sergio Mitre or Ivan Nova, or whoever else the Yankee options are now. But seven years is a little frightening. Seven years is a little frightening, and 150 million dollars is a lot of money. I don't know if he's a sure, sure, sure thing. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, he'll be great in the Phillies. He, you know, there's less pressure there, I think, because of the they have three other guys in the rotation that are going to be great. So, you know, there's no pressure there. I guess he's happy there. He likes all the guys. Apparently, he wants to be in Philly. So, do you wish that uh, the Yankee fans hadn't taunted his wife? Because that's the real reason he didn't want to go. Your fans blew it. I know. I, yeah, I, I wish that Yankee fans were smarter than to throw beer and spit at his wife, since we're obviously everybody knew since well, two years ago, that the Yankees were going to try and woo this guy, so you hope they'd be a little swifter. Yeah. I have a tendency to think that that's something that people that hate the Yankees like to bring up and taunt that their oh, fans are all thugs and violent. 
I don't know. I mean, fifty million dollars could buy a lot of towels to wipe off the spit in the beer, you know. <laughs> so I, I a lot of wet naps. That's a lot of wet naps. I think that's a little overhyped by it in the media and stuff. Who knows? In his heart of hearts, what he really wanted to do. I mean, maybe you can liken it to a LeBron James thing. I mean, it sounds like he was really bummed out when he got traded by the Phillies the first time. Yeah. Maybe it was like a good clubhouse, good group of guys, and he wanted to hang out there and stay there. And he went, took a pay cut to go and and play with his friends, you know. I mean, the no. Yankees made the. I mean, uh, you know, I would love to fault Cashman as much as anybody, but uh, aside from pounding his fist on the table and saying, "Here's our offer. You have a, a day to consider it, and then it's withdrawn." You know, people don't always respond to that kind of aggressive nature either. So I'm not sure. You know, the Yankees offered the most years and the most money, and he said no. I'm going to say he played it badly since you didn't get him. Well, yeah, clearly. But, I mean, maybe it's like when the Red Sox tried to get to share him. Maybe the guy just wanted to go somewhere else, and, and no matter what you did, there was no way you were going to get him. No, he's – that's a lot. That's different because he, <laughs> he has no soul. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I wish I wish it hadn't dragged on as long as it did so he had time to go talk to the Phillies. But, you know, if you said you have 24 hours to decide this, he might be like, I decide right now, no. You know, you might get your nose out of the joint about that. So, I mean, I think the the real mistake was at the trading deadline when they they should have, you know, put a gun to the Mariners' head and said, basically, this is the deal. We're ready right now. It's not going to be on the table an hour from now. Yeah. And then allow the Mariners to then shop him around for a better offer. And then if he, you know, you got him at the trading deadline, he likes New York. He remembers how much he likes CC. They hang out. You know, his wife doesn't get spit on, whatever. Then maybe he signs with the Yankees now. But... You know, you can't. Uh, I mean, you, uh, all I can think of is the only other guy I remember who turned down the most years and most money from the Yankees was Greg Maddox, and the Yankees then beat him in the World Series that following year. So oh. let's hope history repeats itself. I used to I, have a lot of bitterness towards Greg Maddox's wife, who's I think it's like Cindy Maddox or something, because the Yankees like wined and dined her and sent her to a Broadway show and everything, and and she didn't care for New York, so he ended up in Atlanta. And this was in the drought years of the Yankees when they hadn't won a World Series since I was eight. Right. So I was very bitter towards Cindy Maddox, and I enjoyed that World Series when Greg Maddox got beaten by the Yankees. So I have maybe a plea the same will happen with Lee. I have a plea for America. Mm. Let's stop saying that Cliff Lee took, like, a massive pay cut and how noble it was because mm. he wanted to fight. He followed his heart to Philadelphia and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. First of all, he's getting five years and $120 million. Yeah, I think his family will eat. Yeah, I think he's okay. Second of all, it, they said there's a six year that will be vested very easily, assuming like he's yeah, just basically competent. Thing, like that's, right. that's another twenty million. So really, now we're at six years, one forty, which is effectively what the Yankees offered him mm-hmm. until they went up to the seventh year. But anyway, and I think that Texas offered him like six years, one thirty two. Do they offer him like a, a menu of options, basically whatever you know he could have yeah. different years or different money, basically. I mean, it, there, there's a little more risk for him, mm-hmm. not not catastrophic or anything. And and again, 120 million, and he's yeah. already made some money. So I think I think Cliff's going to eat, and I think he's going to have a nice house. <laughs> and I think his kids are going to be able to go to college. Won't be living in a cardboard box on the streets of Philly. <laughs> uh, the the guy that I think should be like, you know, happy, but yet a tiny bit, a little bit upset is Halliday. Just a little. Why should he be upset? Do you think? Because they gave Money? him the extension, and they were like, "Hey, we don't go more than three years. You got to take the three years, sixty million. Sorry." And he he took a little bit of a discount, and they played the, you know, this is what we do, this is how we do things. You uh-huh. play here, you have to sacrifice a little. And then they're like, "Hey, Cliff Lee, five years, one twenty. Well, the interesting thing I read about the Phillies today is that they apparently have, I don't know if this is accurate, I read it on the internet, so it must be, it was on the internet, oh. um, if, that they have $170 million tied up at 19 players right now. Mm. Not, I mean, I know Philadelphia's a big market, but they don't act like a big market team normally. That's a lot of money. I mean, that could be like a one-year rental deal. See if Cliff Lee likes it next year when they after they if they win the World Series this year and they trade off everybody or sell off everybody and he's the only guy left standing. Well, wait a second though. Didn't didn't they get everybody in Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania to pay for their ballpark? This is before we knew that what a stupid idea it is to have the public pay for ballparks. <laughs> probably all these. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it was probably publicly financed. Yeah. So I mean, it's not like uh, they're not like some other franchises where. But the Yanks put up some of their own cash, right? Yeah, but they kind of held the city of New York hostage, too. They got tax breaks or sort of subsidies somehow, yeah. 
I'm pretty sure Phillies was publicly funded. Probably. You should probably look this up before we do the podcast. Probably. I think it was, because wasn't that a big thing about how in Pennsylvania they financed the uh, Eagles, Lincoln Financial Field or whatever, they financed that, and then the Phillies won at the same time? Right. Because if you're publicly funded, then that gives you a little more money to splurge. Right. With the big boys, which is what the Phillies have done. It, it is a pretty crazy top four. I'm, I'm hard-pressed. I guess you'd have to go back to the Atlanta foursome when Steve Avery was good. Yeah. During those two years before he fell apart. Right. Um, for a foursome that looks like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, on paper, it's a you know phenomenal. It's a phenomenal rotation. I mean, their offense is not great. It, it, Jimmy Rollins had a down year last year, and Ryan Howard had a huge down year. So their offense wasn't didn't really set the world on fire. And they're probably. I mean, there's rumors they're going to get rid of Abanias now too, and they lost Jason Worth. Right. So, I mean, yeah, they're going to win a lot of games 2-1 to one and 1-0, one to nothing, presumably. But in an international league, you know, they're going to be very good, obviously, and especially in the NL East. It is a little bit easier to, to find bats than it is to find top-of-the-line yeah. starters. Definitely. Like, uh, as Cody Ross would attest. <laughs> as the Yankees are learning this morning. Yeah. As, as Juan Uribe last year on the uh, – on the Giants, who then stumbled into the $21 million Dodgers contract. But it does seem like those guys are out there offensively. Yeah, you could always find some guy off the scrap heap or whatever, yeah, for yeah. A, that can swing a bat. All right, let's swing to the Red Sox. So, oh, what a juggernaut in the making. The Gonzalez trade, you can't even, I mean, try to pee on it. I dare you. Well, I mean, all I can hang my hat on is that this is a guy who's played in his hometown his whole career with no pressure whatsoever, none whatsoever. And now he's going to come into the hotbed of Boston, 47 media cameras and newspapers following him at all times, yep. fans living and breathing with every single thing that he does or doesn't do. I think it's a big a big change for him. And he can talk about Ted Williams all he wants and his desire to be a Red Sox, but it's a little different playing in the AL East than it is playing in San Diego. I mean, he's put up huge numbers in San Diego in a cavernous ballpark, so you got to like his chances to hit a lot of home runs, obviously. And he's, you know, solid defensively, apparently. I've never seen this Padres play a game, so this is all <laughs> based on what I've read. <laughs> but, um, They're not televised. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, the thing I like is, well, he led the National League in walks. Yeah, because there wasn't any other player on the San Diego Padres. I'd pitch carefully around him, too, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, obviously he's a very good player. He's, a, he's you know, it's a huge upgrade for them. Thanks, Johnny. It's, it's, I, you know, I'm going to hang my hat on the pressure thing and bad shoulder and never been there before and done it in the American League. But You left out the uh, easier easier to put up stats in the NL thing. That you, too, you yeah, sure. You that one out too, but, you know, I mean, not necessarily true. But it, <laughs> I, I could say, you know, it's quadruple A as opposed to now he's in the majors. I could, I could pull that out. Maybe cold weather bothers him, a little cold weather early in the year. Well, as you know... As you know, I judge all Red Sox transactions by emails I get from the fans that that team left. Yeah. And uh, 100% approval rate for Gonzalez. Yeah, there wasn't a Padre big, fan. He's their they, most popular player, their biggest star. What else are they going to say? They're, I'm sure they're all bummed out. That's not true. Sometimes you sign, you get other teams' players and the fans laugh. No, like John Lackey, that's true. JD, yeah, John Lackey, the Angel fan. I didn't know a single Angels fan who wasn't delighted that we overpaid John Lackey, which is never a good sign. And same thing with J.D. Drew, obviously, which I wrote about a little bit last week when, you know, I think I ran it. I had a whole section in my mailbag devoted to very mean J.D. Drew emails right after we signed him <laughs> <laughs> that winter. Um, this is this was the opposite with Gonzalez. Yeah, definitely. Just a lot of uh, people sad to see him go. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, they reached that final stage when not only sad to see him go, but we'll still root for him on the Red Sox because oh, they sure. just want to be in a good team. So that's always nice. It's you good to see. Sure. Great. Carl Crawford, um, not not the same kind of gushing emails. The the take from the Tampa fans was more um, just really fun to watch day to yeah. day. And we'll have like the occasional ball into the gap that has no business being a triple, but it'll be a triple anyway, and torments the Posada type catchers that can't throw and gamer. I mean, the bad uh, thing for his stats, for him, is that he doesn't get to steal against the Red Sox any longer. So true. that's hurtful. He lost 10 stolen bases. <laughs> I think that cuts his steals in half. He doesn't get to run against Veritek anymore, so that hurts. But um, I was hoping the Yankees would sign him because the, the, uh, other than like the uh, extra 12 homers, the mm-hmm. difference between him and Brett Gardner 
is negligible, yeah. Yeah. It they, really is. For the money involved, it wasn't worth an extra 50. I don't know what Brett Gardner makes, probably the minimum or close to it. So It's like under a million bucks for him, and you would have had to pay 20 for Carl Crawford. Yeah. It's been in like would have been like a million dollars a homer. For like a little more pop, basically. Yeah. That's all it would have given you over Brett Gardner. So, yeah, I can't say as I was brokenhearted that the Yankees didn't get him, but I, it does scare me that the Red Sox have him in their lineup, that they now have a speed factor with him and Ellsbury for however long Ellsbury stays uh, uninjured. But, you know, and I'm shocked by it, frankly, because when they went out and they did a $160 million extension on Gonzalez, I figured they were done. It's it's yeah. no one like the Red Sox to spend $300 million. Feeling the heat, the same Johnny. Thing for 35 years that their fans castigated me and every Yankee fan about spending money, buying championships, you know, pillaging from small market teams that couldn't afford it. This was the worst thing in the world, and you know the Boston Dirt Dogs. They did it the old-fashioned way through the draft, and Theo and <laughs> so wise and smart and drafting players, and that's oh. the right way to do it. Bring them up through your system. By the way, out the window now. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and also, welcome to the dark side. It was never true either. <laughs> of course, it wasn't true. But at least now we all, we know that it was complete rank BS for thirty five years. They uh, the Pedro trade in nineteen ninety eight. It was very mendacious on the part of Red Sox fans. <laughs> the Pedro trade in nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, that, I mean that was a sample of it. Sure, the start. That's of it. when it started, and then we paid one hundred sixty million for Manny. I know, but those were those were unique transactions in 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 separate years. To do it all in one big splash, to drop $300 million in the course of a week is, is so un-Red Sox-like and, and frankly Steinbrennerian, if that's a word, uh, that it's just shocking to me as a Yankee fan. And part of me was kind of happy about it. I'm like, well, this is good. You've, you've become what you've hated. This is fantastic. Oh, stop it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely fantastic. They really did have to do something. Like Even my dad, who's a, a, a really rational Red Sox fan for the most part and is a big picture guy and doesn't like panic signings and like didn't like uh, the Danny Darwin and Andre Dawson signings. Mm-hmm. Like, but even he was like, we got to do something because no, nobody is interested in this team. Everybody is Celtics Pats. <laughs> right. And now the golden age of Boston sports continues again. I mean, the Celtics are – the best team in the East, arguably. The Patriots are the best team in football, and the Red Sox have an all-star at almost every position. Except We're Red back, Sox. Johnny. Unbelievable. So bummed out. Don't leave out the bees with Taylor Sagan. Sure. Yeah, I guess they're good, too. I don't know. I don't follow hockey. Ah, uh, was we guys franchise center now, <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. He was like the number one draft pick or something. Um, yeah, it's looking good for the city of Boston. It's great. We, uh, I do think, though, with this Red Sox team, it still is going to come down to the starters in those big series coming through. And, like, I still don't trust John Lackey. Right. I don't know what I'm getting from Josh Beckett this year. As a Yankee fan, what I try to hang my hat on is that their their starting rotation is shaky uh, outside of Lester and Buck Holtz. And Buck Holtz really needs to prove to me he can do it a second year in a row. The rest of their rotation is shaky. Their catching position is horrific. It's so, not good. Machia and Veritek. I mean, give me a break. You know, it's bad when I got disappointed that we didn't sign Miguel Oliva. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, he went to the Mariners. I mean, that's that's terrible de- defense. Yeah. And they're a little weak up the middle with Lowry or Scudero at short, I think, and Ellsbury in center. I don't think that's great. But that lineup, I mean, Big Poppy's going to hit forty home runs. He's going to have. He's going to hit six, and, and I don't know who else you pitch to. I base it on you know last year's Red Sox lineup when when Euclid and Ped Roya were hurt. I, there was nobody in that lineup that I was really afraid of. Wait, what did you just say? I said when Euclid and Ped Roya were hurt. Hey, <laughs> when they were out last year, that lineup really didn't scare me at all. And yeah. now I look at guys there that scare me, and there's there's quite a few. Yeah, just wait until Jeter shows up in mid March with the extra fifteen pounds of muscle. <laughs> Everybody talks about it. He's got a new trainer, new celebrity trainer, and he's really changed his diet, and he's really strong now. <laughs> so the Sox lineup is going to be good. And, and, you know, you have to figure that – I mean, I think Lackey is what Lackey is, but you have to figure Beckett is going to bounce back. Not that he's getting any younger, but you figure he can't be as bad as he was last year. Hmm. And and you, you're weak in the closer department, too. <laughs> Because Papelbon is... Is that your expert opinion? What's that? Is that your expert opinion? (laughs) That's a five-year-old's expert opinion, yeah. I actually thought they were going to trade him. Well, they were were dangling him out there, I think. Uh, They dangled him. They still will. Maybe maybe they'll trade him for prospects or something and let Bard be the closer. They dangled him like Brett Favre with a cell phone. (laughs) (laughs) 
Nobody bit, Johnny. <laughs> no, sir. Just like Brett Favre with his old phone, nobody bit. <laughs> Return to sender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they're they're going to be in the. Uh, it was awkward last year, and I think it's going to be even more awkward this year because Bard will, will be better than he was last year. He'll have more confidence of that. He'll be that classic Wetland Rivera scenario. Yeah, exactly. Where you're, where you're much more comfortable with your setup guy than the guy who's your your closer in the Ab- rock of the bullpen. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but Johnny, these are heady times. They, they are heady times indeed for you. I, I know, and the Yankees. I mean, you know, this is the same Yankees team that wasn't getting any younger last year, and now another year older. And, you know, if Pettit hangs it up, you have two enormous holes in the rotation. So, um, yeah. Not, I, I, heard, I heard that he's not going to hang it up. Well, okay. now his price just went up this morning. You know, yesterday they were offering him $11 million. I think that price went up today because otherwise you're looking at the Sergio Mitre Von Nova poo-poo platter as your fourth and fifth starters, and they don't really want to be there. He supposedly he he uh, found a new strand of HGH that can't be detected by the test. So I would expect Andy back. I, w- I wish I could respond to that in some way, but since he's an admitted steroid user, there's not much defense. Not much defense for me there. Joe Mead was sitting there going, "I wish I could take that out, but I really can't because he's an admitted steroid user." <laughs> right. So yeah, now I'm sure Andy's not cheating. It was a one-time thing. He was injured. He was trying to continue his hey, career. Listen, he went against yeah. the Lord. He sinned, but now he's back. You do it once, you never do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, like Ron Washington and cocaine. Johnny, last question, then I'll let you go. Are you a little worried that now that the big man, George, mm. now that he's dead, and the, and the Suns are running, mm. Fredo, Fredo and uh, Sonny are now running the team, <laughs> um, are you a little worried maybe the free agents don't really trust what's going on there at Yankee Stadium? Uh, well... I mean, I don't know if it's a factor that free agents don't want to go there now or don't trust what's going on, but I think it's a fact. It is a different scenario, certainly, because if George Steinbrenner was still alive, I mean, if Cliff Lee would be a Yankee because he would have just, I mean, he would have wrapped it up a long time ago. Or Cashman would be dead today, one or the other. But uh, with the new guys there, yeah, it's not quite the same feel. And and I mean, you know, when the Yankees brain trust, and it's like uh, Steinbrenner, Hal Steinbrenner. Brian Cashman and Randy Levine. It doesn't really make me feel very comfortable, let's put it that way. I was going to tweet last night when Lee, when the Leaf signing happened that this never would have happened if George Steinbrenner was alive. But it wouldn't have been a joke. It just would have been a factual tweet that would have been boring. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it doesn't quite, that doesn't quite work as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely troubling that George is no longer with us to get these deals done. But, um you're not you're not nearly as upset as I was hoping. If I think you, you me, took some if this medication. happened last week, I would have been so bummed out. But I mean, when it dragged on for five days, I, you know, I was talking about the levels of grief. I've, I'm certainly at the acceptance point. I, mean, I read it in the paper today, and I mean, I was bummed out. Don't get me wrong. And I've been studying. I've been you know searching different websites every, for, yesterday and last week to try and see if this idiot was going to make up his mind and decide. And I eventually just lost interest and just lost faith that he was coming. So I've kind of achieved acceptance on it, basically. Is it true that you were Googling uh, about social disorders last week, trying to figure out if Zach Granke could make it in New York? Or not? Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, Zach Granke is a good pitcher, but any time in the very first paragraph describing him, the word social anxiety disorders fe- yeah. words are featured. I, I lived through the Ed Witts and Butch Weiniger years of the Yankees, so yeah. I'd like to kind of stay away from that if I could. I mean, all Social the- anxiety disorder plus New York plus Yankee Stadium. Not a great mix. Yeah, p- people who didn't have social anxiety disorders uh, fell apart in New York. Yeah, yeah. they developed them. I, all due respect to Zach and what he's accomplished. Absolutely. But I think New York's the, not, a, not a great city for him. No. Or, or, or really anybody. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I think LeBron James, I think for even for – for him, I think he worried about maybe going there. It's a, it's a city for a guy like Amar Stoudemire. There's a guy that's flourished there. Yeah, it's a guy who's got a healthy ego and loves the attention and kind of feeds off it. That's who you want in New York City, I think. Yeah. Most of the time. Joe Namath, guys like that, you know? Joe Namath, Brett Gardner. <laughs> Francisco Cervelli, all the great. <laughs> all right, Johnny. We'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Happy Thank holidays, you. buddy. Thank you. I was hoping for a happy Holly Day, but that never quite worked out. I had the tweet all set, and it just never worked out for me. So. Sorry, buddy. I'll talk all to right. you soon. Take care. That's it for the BS Report. Before we go, I just want to thank everybody who came out for the book signings in New York, Washington, San Francisco, and Dallas. First time I'd been to Dallas. Everybody was great. Everybody couldn't have been nicer. It was great seeing everybody, and the book of basketball is on sale. Amazon, 
other online retailers and bookstores everywhere. Check it out in paperback if you get the chance. Until next time. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Thanks, Bill. Geez, after all that witty and observant sports analysis, it's getting a little warm in here. Oh, wait, forget it. It's actually these ridiculously warm and tasty Subway melts. The new Chipotle chicken and cheese fresh toasted on flatbread. And the new Chipotle steak and cheese built fresh from the bread up with melted in flavor. Just look at that melty cheese. Just want to roll up my sleeves and dive face first into the Italian BMW.